for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Good day to everybody, and welcome to this edition of Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. I'm Stephen Jodderan here in Wisconsin. As always, I'm Akafai in Texas, who likes to sleep during MLS matches. And the one and only Jake Watroba in Minnesota. What's going on, fellas? That's not true. <laughs> well, it, it, it is true, but I have an excuse. It was during the Portland-Seattle game. so One of the worst games pretty- of the weekend. Pretty, pretty, pretty valuable excuse. I, you see, I watched in person FC Dallas beat LA Galaxy three two. What a great fun game! Uh, I saw the uh, Atlanta Orlando two one game. What a mm. great game! NYC LAFC two two. What a great game! <laughs> was and, that the I, best I, game? I, that was the best game of the weekend. NYC LAFC, FC, LAFC. I would LAFC. say LAFC NYC was pretty good. I, I would say Dallas Galaxy was a, just so much just drama going into late in the la- latter minutes of the game. Zlatan nailing the post in like the eighty. Ninth minute, I want to say it was a, it was an interesting game, man, and he's huge. He's <laughs> absolutely massive. Yeah, compared I've, to your I've, five two size, he's like twice your height. No, man, he was towering over everyone, and it was so funny. So he 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 answered one question, and everyone was just looking around. And uh, a buddy of mine, he was doing work for MLS, so he was like, "Uh, does no one gonna ask him more questions?" And everyone just looked at him. He's like, "Oh, okay." So how'd you feel about that? He started asking us. It's weird because, I mean, Zlatan coming to town, you think everyone would ask questions and go crazy. Everyone was, like, scared. <laughs> it was really weird. You didn't bother was, asking something? I didn't need to. It's, now, you're yeah. lame. You should have just <laughs> asked him, hey, thing. can you say Uncle Sam's soccer podcast for me? Just, you know. Uncle Sam's. You're listening to Uncle Sam's soccer podcast. Could you imagine Ibra going with his accent, Swedish accent, and his, like, 12 languages You are he listening to Uncle Sam's soccer podcast. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. That's a, that's my really bad uh, Zlatan Ibrahimov. Uh, that's Ibrahim. awful. I want a refund. That's <laughs> terrible. Jeez. Jake, so you're what fired. What are we talking about today, Stephen? What are we talking about today? All right, we're talking to uh, George Murphy, and he used to be an assistant coach in the Development Academy. He runs DMVSoccer.com, which is the tri-state area. Get some insight into what's going on with Wayne Rooney coming to MLS and what the fans are really talking about. We got the new segment, the counterattack with Jake Watroba. We'll f- debut that. And then I sat down with senior coordinating producer of features for Fox Sports, Jennifer Pransky. She does all those promos and all the features that you'll see in the upcoming World Cup. She's going to talk about that story and what Fox Sports wants to do with the World Cup. But uh, no USA, which is uh, a daily reminder of the sadness of U.S. soccer. USA, hey. USA. Yeah, USA. But let's get to DC United. Joining us on the line is George Murphy. He runs DMVSoccer.com. George, how's it going? Hey, guys. How's it going? Thanks for thanks for having me. Everything's good. Awesome. Well, George covers, uh, I guess, the DC, Virginia, Maryland area soccer. Yeah, we try to we try to handle it. DC, Maryland, Virginia, tri-state area. So we got a lot of a lot of ground to cover between the colleges and we try to do some youth scouts and and then DC United and some USL teams coming to the area as well. So yeah, a lot of soccer to cover here for sure. There, there's plenty of soccer and there's been plenty of news, especially with Wayne Rooney uh, being linked to DC. You're, you're there. What What's all the, what's the buzz about over there? Is it Wayne Rooney coming? Are people excited? Yeah, no, I mean, I think everybody saw Taylor Twelman's rant yesterday. I don't want to call it a rant because it makes it sound crazy, but he wasn't really that crazy. I mean, a lot of stuff he said was, you know, kind of what a lot of, of DC United supporters are, are thinking right now, I think. And that's that, all right, great. You know, DC United's front office is finally starting to spend the money. Uh, there have been rumors of a new owner coming in. Uh, he's the owner of LA Times, I believe, um, kind of bringing some fresh, fresh money to the table and, Past couple of weeks, uh, they've been as well as Carlos Tevez, Fernando Torres. Uh, there were talks of Mario Balotelli that even the league tweeted out. So you're like, all right, you know, the league's tweeting this out. It seems like a pretty for real, you know, transfer rumor. And then all of a sudden, this Rooney thing pops up, and 
you know, it's kind of hard to believe at first. You're like, wait, wait, Rudy's coming to DC United. They've been pretty bad past couple of seasons. They've got one year, one win this year, uh, finished dead last in East last year, and, and they've had a, a tough run lately. So then things start picking up steam, and everybody's got an opinion on it, obviously. And uh, Sebastian Salazar went on ESPN FC and just kind of said, look, I grew up in the DMV. I live in the DMV. This doesn't get me excited because, you know, a lot of people think Wayne Rooney's kind of past it. Uh, maybe also um, kind of the ethnicity of the player came into question, I guess, because it, it is a, a Latino community in certain parts of D.C., Maryland, Virginia, but also a lot of the early day D.C. United success in terms of the attendance records were based on the club doing a better job to reach that Latino community. So there have been a lot of different opinions going around about the Rooney transfer. Some people say that maybe we could have addressed some other needs, but, uh, you know, the club's come out recently and said we we're looking to add two uh, designated players this, this summer. They have Audi Field that's being built, a brand new stadium. So, you know, I, I'd say we ran a poll. Uh, are you excited about Wayne Rooney? And the majority of our, our followers were like, yeah, oh yeah, it's Wayne Rooney. So there are some skeptics out there, but, you know, the biggest thing is the club's finally starting to uh, spend the money. Taylor Twelman said that they have spent zero point zero dollars in the past ten years. It's probably been closer to fifteen, to be honest. I mean, it's been a, a tough ten or fifteen years for DC United supporters after some early success. So you got to do something to get the fans excited. I, I think a, a transfer of Wayne Rooney would do that. Right, DC United has a history of success when it comes to MLS, especially early on. I mean, they've won four MLS Cups, four Supporters Shield, three U.S. Open Cups. But what is the soccer culture like? You alluded to the dynamic within the demographics of the tri-state area. Obviously, early on, it seemed they've seen uh, the club has catered more to the Latino base, and Wayne Rooney, obviously being a white Englishman, is not ideal to cater for that fan base. But what is I, the... I don't know if that's as big a deal as, as Salazar made it out to be. I, I understand that the RFK was packed with more of a Latino fan base before, but here's what's going on right now: is the club is shifting everything to Virginia. They're taking mm. their youth academy and the training fields, and they're going to build a complex out in Loudoun, Virginia, which is like very far uh, from Maryland. It's very far from certain parts of DC. So they're, it, it's almost as if now they're kind of isolating themselves away from. You know, people closer to Annapolis or Baltimore or Montgomery County, whatever it may be. But another issue with the club is that right when the uh, the season started, they basically segregated or separated one of the support groups. They, they put their public support mm -hmm. behind a supporters group called the Screaming Eagles. And there's another big group called Bar Brava that were kind of like, well, hey, we're here too. We've been around for as long as I can remember. Um, and the club just never publicly came out and said, hey, Bar Bravo, sorry about that. They never responded. And they kind of have a history of that. The club just doesn't really seem to, in my opinion, have the finger on the pulse of the local supporters, communities, and just kind of public outreach um, this season because they have the, the field that's being constructed. They had to play a game in Annapolis uh, at Navy Field. And everybody's kind of like, well, we haven't heard anything from the club for marketing or really community outreach to kind of try to sell some tickets until the last minute. It just, man, all these little things just pile up. Um, in addition to the, the club's academy, not being able to keep some of the top players. Mm. So, which Taylor Swalman kind of alluded to, we had Jeremy Ibo, Ibo Bise, who ended up going to Portland, but he grew up in this area. DC never, never really identified him. Um, Eric Williamson, a top Maryland standout. They offered him a contract and then he ends up in Portland also. And, that's been kind of going on for the past couple of years. So it's a number of different things that, you know, fans are like, well, we're sick of these kind of third rate players that we keep buying and trying to hype up. At least we're getting a new player in that we're excited about. But I think a lot of people are just kind of losing trust in the team, to be honest with you. You know, it's, it sounds very familiar in the shoes that Armand and I sit with FC Dallas and part of me with New England Revolution. It's just the ownership. Just or the front office of the club has their head in between their legs, and I don't know, dreaming. I was I was about to say that, Stephen. It I, I was I was about to say that that sounds a lot like many of the other MLS original uh, squ uh, sides that they seem to just it, the issues that the issues that you're saying. I bet you you could put them in any of those other MLS original sides and then say, yeah, we 
see the same thing. It, it's 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 honestly really interesting how the there are so many I guess similarities between between these sides in terms of that uh, that dynamic. And it makes me think: Is it more of a, a issue of uh, just the MLS, the MLS, uh, the MLS original side just being neglected? I, I, I'm not sure, but yeah, I think there are a lot of behind-the-scenes things that also are playing in. I, I think that certain clubs and, and certain agents that don't only deal with, I think that the league itself also steers players uh, to certain certain newer teams: Cough Cough, Atlanta United, Cough Cough. So. <laughs> you know, man, I, I think there's there's a lot going on that just, you know, I attended the president, you know, the presidential election. I covered it as a member of the media and just saw some things in terms of certain guys being there and, and kind of, you know, it's almost like this group of ex-players and front office and agents that just kind of, and media members also, that just, you know, man, I, I don't want to talk bad about DC United as a club. I don't want to talk about some of the, the off uh, off the field stuff, but I, I do get the impression that there's a lot more to it than what we see in terms of certain agents dealing with clubs and things like that. What about the new stadium? Obviously, that's been huge. And I mean, a lot of us, you know, across the country look at that stadium. I personally think it's a little bit small, but I mean, it's a soccer specific stadium. It looks well, dope. What do you, what's the impression from the locals about the stadium? That's another issue, man. I mean, you know, I've been a DC United fan all my life. I was at the first ever DC United home game. My dad took me all at the All Star games and playoff games. But we've needed a soccer stadium for 20 years now. I mean, we're the DC metro area is a, a pretty decent area in terms of soccer. We got DC and also Baltimore, um, which is a, a traditional soccer city. And Virginia, Maryland. I mean, the whole area. We deserve a soccer stadium, but it's 2018 and we finally are getting it. So, you know, a lot of people are excited about it. The issue is. I guess if I had to be a pessimist about it, there's no parking. There's not a parking lot in the state around the stadium. It's just like one of those things where you got a Metro in or uh, rent like a parking space from somebody that's got an app that kind of sells their spaces in the neighborhood. So, you know, there's no tailgating. Uh, it's going to be kind of a pain in the butt to get to, but we'll see, man, I'm trying to keep my, my optimistic hat on. Um, but yeah, I think at overall, I think people are pretty excited about it. Do you think DC is just waiting to put all uh, their eggs uh, in, in, when Audi Field opens? It's that one basket, you know, with the DPs uh, com- coming in. They'll probably be able to play after Audi Field uh, opens. And also the marketing aspect as well. You said there was a lack of it for those two uh, two home matches or quote-unquote home matches. Uh, do you think they're just waiting for uh, Audi Field to open and then they're going to go all out? Or is that just a hope? I think that's one of the main reasons why they're they're – the new ownership's coming in, but also they're looking for a big star to, to open the stadium. Yeah. Um, I think that they're scheduled to open in like earlier mid July. Don't quote me on that. So, you know, do you get the Wayne Rudy deal done by then? He's not going to be playing in the world cup. And then do they want to bring in like one more big name? Um, I would say that it seemed like the Wayne Rooney talks are really picking up and it seems like to the point where it's like almost, I guess done. Uh, but yeah, I think they're really hustling to get that deal done just so that they can, have a big star to just kind of show off at the new stadium and really get fans excited. I mean, they need something to really be excited about after 15 years of just pretty much, you know, the last biggest star we had was uh, Dwayne De Rosario towards the mm. end of his career. And I think that was the 2012, but I mean, even before then it was, there were some real bargains that were uh, looking to be had in terms of DC United transfer market. So yeah, new stadium, new signing, maybe we, we make one or two more and we, we got to do something. I mean, we've won one game all season, and something's got to change. So, yeah. Is the Wayne Rooney signing the something that people look and kind of roll their eyes at just because the club has been so terrible on the field? I mean, is it hard? Do My question is, do D.C. United supporters go to the team no matter what? Or when the team does well, you see an increase in attendance. I was looking at attendance numbers. Um, they have averaged about 17, uh, 18,000 last four years, five years when the league's average has increased, but DC United's not, hasn't necessarily been in that swing of increase, obviously with Atlanta coming in or Orlando, they're, they're really pumping and inflating those numbers or the league average up. 
But DC United's I think attendance. Was that the last couple of years, there was genuine concern that the stadium might crumble on everybody. Like oh. that's how old RFK was. Yeah, I mean it's you're going to a match there, and it's it's got to be one of the worst stadiums in the country. You know, great venue and you to kind of go and watch the games, but A, the team's been terrible, and B, the stadium's older than, you know, I'm a Redskins fan. It was a Redskins stadium back in the 70s and 80s. So, you know, it's a number of different things, but you got to put a product on the field to get fans excited, and, you know, ownership hasn't been spending the money. And who wants to take, you know, their families to that stadium, to be honest with you? So, yeah, I think it's a combination of just the quality on the field and, and the stadium, the current stadium set up. So with the re- reported fees, they're they're talking. Uh, I think I'm, this is from Stephen Goff's article that it, it would be around fifteen to twenty million. That's with the salary. That's with the uh, transfer fee as well as are combined. Do you, in your eyes, in your opinion, do you think uh, a, a thirty-two old Wayne Rooney is worth that price? Yeah, I don't think there's many doubts about it. I mean. He scored, a t- he scored some decent goals for Everton this year. I know a lot of people are saying, well, a lot of them were penalties. But, mm-hmm. you know, what I look at it is, like Taylor Twelman brought it up yesterday, he's not 35 or 36, but he's also not, you know, with the – Pirlo wasn't a big guy. But Wayne Rooney's not a big guy. He's like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, he's not like Lampard or Gerard or these older English guys who have bigger bodies and they're putting so many miles on their knees and ankles. He's still a, you know, a world-class player. He might not make the England World Cup squad, but he's still – Better than anybody DC United's got. Um, I know Salazar said, well, we could get Diego Valeri for that much money, but Diego Valeri plays in the United States and 98% of people don't have any idea who he is. <laughs> yeah. So you, you get a big name, you know? I mean, yeah. you, you got Diego <laughs> Valeri in the lineup. And yeah, so, you know, he'll be the biggest star in DC. He'll be bigger than John Wall. He'll be better and bigger than Ovechkin. Um, I don't think people really understand the star power of Wayne Rooney, who was. You know, along with Ronaldo, Manchester United's best player when they won a double in Champions League and, mm. you know, went on all those runs a couple years ago. Mm. So I, I think his quality is really – he's still a world-class striker. Um, I, I think he would do well in MLS. But then, of course, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if the guy's got an injury or what. So I think so. I'd spend the money just to get people excited about it. But then you look at the overall DC United roster and they have a lot of needs. So – I could see the argument, well, that money might be spent on uh, different positions. Who knows? But yeah, overall, most of our followers are excited about it. I'm excited about it. I think that most people who watch soccer over the years know that Wayne Rooney possesses the quality. And yeah, I don't see why he wouldn't be excited about Wayne Rooney. So. Well, George, we appreciate it. Um, it's our shameless plug, so go ahead and plug DMV Soccer as well, where we could follow you on Twitter and all that good stuff. Yeah, dmvsoccer.com. Actually, I am writing a piece on Joe Zhao currently. We're writing, running an interview this week. He's making a move. He's um, announcing a transfer. So go check us out later this week and follow us on Twitter, dmvsoccer.com. Um, and I'm George Murphy. That's all, that's all I got. Not too shameless of a plug, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate it. I mean, some great insight and great talk, context into our discussion with Wayne Rooney coming to MLS. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you for having me. I I really appreciate it. All righty. Let's talk some Wayne Rooney. Come on. Do you really... I don't remember much of Wayne Rooney's career at Man United. That's I really because don't. You're a fake soccer fan, but um, I remember his bike. That was, that was beautiful against City. I thought you were Euro snob. Yeah, but yeah, Wayne Rooney you were too. really. Wayne Rooney does not move the needle. What do you mean? He's the all-time goal scorer for England. Eh. Look, my mind's changed. I thought Wayne Rooney wouldn't be necessarily like ah, oh, they shouldn't move for him. But like, ever since people in my mentions called me an idiot, which you know they're not wrong. Sometimes, but um, no, yeah, I think I think uh, Rooney would be a, a great signing actually for DC United. I just don't, I just don't think he's worth the price tag. Screw the price Is tag. That... Who cares? You're not paying for it. It's I a, am. But here's the thing: it's a DP spot, so pay whatever you want. Pay the freak through the freaking nose for this guy. 
I'm my question is who are they going to land behind Wayne Rooney because they're going to have to add another piece. They need a, somebody in the midfield. Do you think they go after an an Iniesta type? I mean, I don't I I don't know, but the one thing I do know is that DC United is absolutely awful and <laughs> the power rankings I do for Pro Soccer USA every single week I just put down bad. That's my description. They're bad. They're not they're really not that fun to watch. And they always figure out ways to lose games. Ben Olsen is not a good coach. He should have been sacked like uh, a while ago. I mean, in 2012 or 2013, back when NBC had the rights to MLS, DC United was good. They were winning games. They beat, I think, was it, I don't know if they beat the Red Bulls, but they played one of the games where it was like snowing. Yes, and I remember del- what they, you're talking they, about. Yeah. They had to delay the game. And. Those days, DC actually wasn't like half bad. I mean, they were actually like okay to watch. But now they're just pitiful. I mean, they 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 figured out a way to get Yamil Assad and Paul Ariello and just not utilize them to their full potential, which blows my mind because you remember how good Assad was in Atlanta and Ariello is a U.S. Men's National Team player and was playing well for Cholos in Liga MX. So like, I, I don't know. I, there's so many things that need help. I mean, Wayne Rooney would definitely make the team better but i think people are scared that he's going to end up like george said as a lampard or a gerard type signing you know who's really jumping up and down right now it's mls they get another team to market on television this is another matchup to have eyes come to the tv it's wayne freaking rooney right so you see dc united you're flipping through Midsummer, screw baseball. You're not going to watch fishing either or golf. So you're like, oh, oh, Wayne Rooney's whoa, on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Fishing? Who the who in the hell is watching fishing ever? Uh, I don't know. I, just... I don't know, Jake. When, on ESPN, on, when there's a game on ESPN Plus, uh, I forgot what game it was, but on ESPN it was cornhole. <laughs> <laughs> on ESPN. Yo, that that just to go on a tangent, just like a split second. That annoys me so much that MLS can't get on ESPN on over. Freaking cornhole! <laughs> I feel like cornhole outdraws it. <laughs> it doesn't really. The, I feel the, like the it does. people in the bar they're filming in. Yeah, I guess. I feel, like, I feel like I feel like it does. Like genuinely, I feel like it does. And I, but I do think Wayne Rooney is a proper step in that direction to you know get the eyeballs, get the viewers, and it's gonna make the team on paper at least better. Yeah, but right? how much like, better? They suck. I mean, I don't. You, people don't realize they blow. Could anybody name? More than five players off that squad right now. I mean, I could, but I don't count, right? Try it. Try it. No, seriously. Um, so, uh, th- is it, it's not, it's Brilliant, uh, Luciano Acosta, uh, Yamil Assad, Paul Ariola, Steve Birnbaum. I think that's five. Um, I have four. <laughs> um, you could be making these names up. And... No, those are 100% real. You can go look them up. Fact no, I, 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 I've heard some of them, yes, but I'm just saying. To just kind of build off of what Steven's saying is, you could make off, you could make up names, and people still wouldn't know if you were telling the truth. Oh, or David not. Osted. Yeah, now there you're you just go. googling this stuff. We can't. That's not. No, fair. that was off the top of my head. That was off the top of my head. Oh, that's six. That's the only six I know. But the, the point being is, a lot of people have no idea that this club exists in MLS. That I, I'm pretty sure people are like, oh, DC United, what? Here's another thing: is the team is going to now be marketed when it travels. Come watch Wayne Rooney. I know FC Dallas will promote the crap out of that. Wayne, if, if they ever play, I don't know what the FC Dallas' schedule is, but going traveling to New England, come watch Wayne Rooney and DC United. Oh, Wayne Rooney's coming in town. I'll go to the game. You know, it's 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 good for the league in, in the sense that it brings eyeballs to the television and it sells more tickets home and away. That's everything the league wants. Who I don't think the league genuinely cares if the team is good or bad. They just want people to spend money and waste time watching the games on television on a Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Would you watch uh, D. Snyder, Wayne Rooney? Hell yeah. I mean, at least for the first couple of games. If they're bad, no. then I'm probably not going to watch. Like LA Galaxy, I'm still watching because of the Ebro factor. But isn't there a certain point where people are like, dude, the team just sucks? The, what's the point of watching? That's the thing. The team needs to improve across, I, I would say, all. I think Tara Tolman hit the hammer on the head in terms of if this jump starts to spending for other things like the academy. And he, did he not mention, I don't know if you guys listened to the whole, well, I guess I'm going to call it rant because it's easier to call it a rant. But he said that there's 
people within the organization doing multiple jobs. That's pretty unacceptable for like a professional team. Am I wrong? Like they're doing mo- like he said he said there was like people doing three or four jobs. Yeah, this isn't the USL or NASL like, or one major of these league soccer. This is yeah, the- but isn't that MLS's life. fault? Isn't that single? Isn't the blame go to MLS because it's a single entity system? I mean, I haven't heard anyone in Dallas say they ha- they have to do four or five jobs. I mean, I'm I'm sure they wouldn't openly say it, but I've also seen it with my eyes. I don't see that. If if, if DC United they've played at RFK, that stadium is. George is right. That stadium is garbage. I mean, I don't know if you've seen it. There's the, the raccoon jokes. That's, uh, <laughs> like, there's raccoons everywhere. Um, someone was tweeting. I think it was Pablo Mario. He was just like, yeah, like, we were, like, fearing for, like, there was, like, a bunch of, like, insects and stuff, like, birds in the stadium just, like, camping out. Like, that stadium is a dump. And the fact that it took them this long to move from there into the, into the stadium is – I don't know, man. I mean, I talked to someone. I was like, yeah, you moved moving to the new stadium – Took a little while. I was like, man, this you know what's crazy? Years waiting. Twenty years. You know what's crazy? The U.S. had, I think, a friendly against Germany at that stadium, like three or the, four years ago. The centennial game the against with, year. yeah, with Klinsmann, yep. right? Five, was the fourth three five four game? Something like that. And the U.S. won. Yeah, they did. It was, but the stadium sucks. The dump. It is a dump. But Jake, let, let's get your tank. Wayne Rooney to MLS. A, do you spend that money? And B. Um, does it move the needle for you? Do I spend that? Okay. No, I don't spend the money. I get it. It's probably going to put people into the seats, but I, I just, I don't know how much, like what, what, what does he do though? Like, okay. So let's say Wayne Rooney plays three years in MLS after year one, after you've seen him play once or whatever, I don't, you don't care to see him again. That then it, it, the, the mystique is kind of gone. You've seen it. Okay. Why do I need to watch DC United? You know that that that, that I, I think it's just a band aid to put over a problem, which is DC United's terrible and no one cares about them. So we're gonna buy Wayne Rooney and it'll look good for a year and people will be excited about it and then then it wears off. You know, and that's it's kind of like again what Taylor Twelman said yesterday is, what are you gonna do after Wayne Rooney? You know, are you gonna bring in more players? Are you gonna you know fix your academy system? You know, I. I'm not gonna watch if it, so if DC United's on ESPN or Fox playing Chicago Fire or something, just throwing out a random team. I'm not watching. I don't care. Sorry. <laughs> not don't Bastian care. Schweinsteiger just, versus Wayne no, Rooney. Yeah, yeah, Bastian Schweinsteiger versus Wayne Rooney on Sunday at four o'clock on FS1. <laughs> no, I don't care. I really don't care. Um, I <clears throat> put on Atlanta United. Put on. LAFC put on SKC you know put on a good team I that's that's uh, the I don't think because it's soccer I don't think MLS can just go and market its quote-unquote stars you know I think it needs to market good soccer and good atmospheres and you're not going to have you're probably not going to see good soccer and a good atmosphere when you watch DC United to just be brutally honest with you Here's, um, no I, I think you're you're on to a good point because I was having this conversation and with some other buddies watching MLS this past Sunday, the Portland Seattle game was putrid. Awful. It was honestly it was a disgrace to soccer rivalries. That's how bad the game was on the field. I told you guys rivalries suck. <laughs> oh, here we go again. Here we go again. I, I didn't know you said that. <laughs> the po- but the thing is, it's the style of the teams that makes the game so bad. I, I the Orlando City Atlanta United game was so much more enjoyable to watch because of the styles that Atlanta brought and just Orlando City's, I don't know, free form too. They're, they're starting to play a little more open and with some speed. But Atlanta United's pace and the fact that they could almost score off any break or just in possession is just much watch TV. I, with DC United, Wayne Rooney... It's. I think it's a lot like LA Galaxy in the sense that you sit there and you go like, you just got to wait for Ebro to make something out of it. If not, you're just going to have a ton of balls like Olimar Kamara just loft it up 12 seconds too late and Ebro get frustrated or Wayne Rooney get frustrated. Now, I don't think Rooney will be as bold as Ebro to show that emotion on the field, but I think in the back of his head, he's going to be like, crap, why did I trade up Everton Football Club for DC United? They play barbaric soccer. It's like 
soccer you'd see in like it it's just it hasn't it haven't advanced. It's Ben Olsen. Ben Olsen is not the greatest coach in the world. I think we've seen that. Uh especially during this season. He can't even he can't use Yamil Assad and Paul Wright. I think that's a really important aspect because we saw Assad flourish with Atlanta and now you're looking at him you're like, Oh I don't I don't know what he's doing right now. Why isn't he getting involved? Why haven't we heard a U.S. men's national team player like Paul Ariola's name mentioned that much throughout MLS. He's a good player. I think Why he's a little overrated. Here? Going to DC I United he's proves a he's a little overrated. I still think he's a good player. Or was he in Trinidad? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I gotta say about that. Or was he on one October evening in Trinidad and Tobago in 2017? That's why. Well, the, the, he made the move to DC United after that, right? Or was it before? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No, August my point being is DC United probably made him worse. I mean, look. <laughs> here, here's a here's the thing. He's still a good player, so let's not get let's not get on that tangent. But I, I don't think Ben Olsen is a good coach. It's like Ziggy Schmidt at LA at the at LA Galaxy. I mean, a lot of people were like, "Oh, what's what's up with them? Why aren't they doing well?" I mean, I think it's because you have a coach that's like just MLS 1.0. You know. He's not – there's not like a unique, fresh style. They can't even get Zlatan the ball in his head. And he's like the tallest player in the field. All right, Armand, you – we were putting some – we were doing some pre-show notes. Tell us DC United's record when the transfer window because the money is kind of mind-blowing. Uh, just the amount that they're going to spend on this player in their – you know, when you look at – over look – over its history of the club, it's mind-boggling. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really – it's extremely mind-blowing because, look, the most expensive transfer uh, – this is a just overseas transfers. I actually accumulated a list of five, and uh, I got the numbers uh, from uh, newspaper articles um, and uh, transfermarket.com. Uh, Paul Oriola, his estimated fee was around $3 million. Luciano Acosta, his fee was around 1.4 million. Zoltan Steibert, their other DP, his fee was oh just over 1 million. And then uh, Hamdi Salawi from Rapid Vienna, they signed in 2011. His fee was around 500 thousand. And they got Connor Doyle from Derby, and apparently that was a free transfer, um, according to uh, some outlets. Some outlets say pay, they pay a transfer fee, whatever. They're gonna pay 15 to 20 million dollars for Wayne Rooney. Including uh, including a salary, I'd probably say you'd probably say what like eleven, maybe ten million for his transfer fee. Yeah, I mean he, he makes ten million at uh, Everton right now, or eleven million somewhere around there. Basically, Everton was paying him a million dollars per goal that he scored this past season in I think thirty appearances. Thirty three, I think thirty. Yeah, some but something look, like that. Look, but that's you're going from three million as your highest one to now what? 10 12 13 14 15 that's a that's a massive jump and i mean i feel like they, you know what this, they've been waiting 15 years just for a stadium to open up to pull this money in like yeah and the stadium on. is has risen has swelled up to 400 million dollars so it's it, it's, just, it's just it's sad because dc united should be a franchise that we should be celebrating because they've, they've won the four mls cups they are I guess a former giant, but I mean, I feel like no one knows who they are. Here's a silver lining, though. I wonder if more of a question in a silver lining is: is does this signing and the money spent on this player, including salary, put pressure on on other clubs, particularly the originals? Take Chicago out because they have been willing to spend the money, but the Dallas's, the Houston's, eh, maybe Houston's not necessarily. Not necessarily an original club, but Colorado, New England, these clubs, and going out there to make more splashes in the transfer window to bring in names. No, I don't I think mean, so. Because I mean, why? I guess the why would this? Why would this be the jumping off point for some of those clubs to actually start and start to spend money when you've had? These new expansion franchises, you know, 
spending millions of dollars, you know, on marquee players because they're you new. Got... I think it's expected for the new ones to spend. But when you have, when you're like, it's your little circle of friends, right? When your circle of friends start to do something different, well, then you begin to wonder. Okay, maybe I should take, you know, do the same thing here. I mean, it's like you know, MLS 1.0 versus MLS 2.0 versus 3.0 versus 4.0. It starts to segregate itself in the market. So, you know, all the 1.0s, well, if they all suck, cool. Well, look, we're MLS 1.0, we all suck. So, there's no pressure. As long as, you know, everybody else in your line is doing bad, then cool. Well, we're just status quo here with MLS, you know. Uh, but damn, DC United spent some money. Say there's another big name coming. And, and and it's a World Cup summer, so I expect names to come. Like after the World Cup, expect some 30-year-olds come to MLS. The question is who but and and where will they end up? But names will come. I think one of the bigger names will be Chicharito. The question is, will Dallas, somebody with the Latin American community so strong, will they want to spend that money? Or even Houston. Hell, Colorado could use that because there's a huge Latin American population in Colorado. You have markets out there. The question is, how are you going to do it all? Or maybe even an L- LA Galaxy brings in an Arsene Wenger. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Broke that news first here. Just saying. We broke it last week. We did. We did. <laughs> Alrighty, up next, listeners, is the counterattack with Jake Watroba. It's the counterattack. I'm Jake Watroba. It's a new bit we're trying out here on Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, where I, I guess, introduce a couple topics to Armand and Steven and just get the reactions the first time they're going to hear it. Maybe some lesser talked about stories in U.S. soccer. Uh, maybe maybe we'll play a game. A game? You know, maybe. Yeah, we might play. Actually, today I got a game for you guys. We're going to. Very nice. Very play. nice. I like a lot. So it could be a story. It could be a tweet. It uh, it could be a game. It could be anything for, you know. It's supposed to be quick paced, Jake. Let's go. All right. So we've been talking about Wayne Rooney today a lot. Um, did you guys know Wayne Rooney has 17.2 million Twitter followers? Okay. So keep that in mind. All right. That doesn't. That's not just the fact. I was gonna say I could have figured that that's out. Kind of, so. Yeah, that's a pretty garbage <laughs> fact. Twitter's a very big deal, you guys. He's got a lot of followers. Okay, that's it. So I got. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Wayne Rooney has more Twitter followers than the Washington R words. The Wizards, the Nationals, the Capitals, DC United, Spirit, Mystics, Castles, whatever those are, and Valor combined. Those are all the DC Combined? Combined? Really? Over the Washington Redskins? Yes. R words, R words. R words, R words, R words. Um, No profanity. Yeah, he's got got tons of followers, which I guess you can kind of see why DC United might have brought him in. Um, This is from Dan Steinberg. He writes for the Washington Post in his tweet from three days ago. Uh, he goes, in fact, I'm pretty sure you could combine every DC pro athlete with their Twitter accounts uh, uh, of every DC pro team and Wayne Rooney would still have more Twitter followers. That's insane. That is insane. I, I guess... I, I mean, did not realize that, to be honest with you. I, I think we forget how big of a star he was in the Premier League years ago. I, I, I genuinely do think. I mean, I forgot it. I'm not gonna lie. But now that you put in perspective, recency it, bias. Well, George, George, is, 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 when, when we spoke with him, did allude to that he would be the biggest star, right, or biggest, you know, most popular athlete in the DC area. And I think this really puts it into perspective. Wow, that's insane. insane. So he has more followers than any of the sports teams combined that in the DC area. That's uh, that's what I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. What other players like that? You think Zlatan might be like that? Um, I don't know. You can definitely check, but I want to, you know, keep this thing moving here. Oh. Um, something a little bit more. Uh, this could be. This could be deemed frustrating. We'll, we'll go with that. That's probably a good word. This is. This is an email from oh. U.S. Soccer to one of its. Uh, let's just say coaching candidates. I guess would be the best way to put it. Uh, I won't say who it is or whatever. Not that it matters because I only have his first name. But the email that this uh, this person received stated that um, thank you for your interest 
in the following U.S. soccer coaching courses. The coaching course was U.S. Soccer Late 2018 B-Course Review. We appreciate you taking the time to apply for a course to continue your education and your patience while we reviewed all applicants. The application process was very competitive given the strength of a highly qualified pool of applicants. Unfortunately, after reviewing your application, you have not been selected to attend this course. Although you must be disappointed with this response, we encourage you to continue your development as a coach. Based on the following criteria, the course roster has been filled with the most qualified applicants. And it follows. Current coaching environment, past experiences related to coaching, a demonstrable commitment to continued education. If you have any questions, feel free to contact blah, 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 blah. So, all right. So after failing to qualify for the World Cup, it's basically been discussed that we need more coaches, you know, developing the youth, that whole that whole sort of thing. What is your guys' take that U.S. soccer is turning people away who are trying to get their coaching license? Um, it fits right in with their mantra of, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's, uh, I think it's bizarre. Days rejected him, right? Yeah, yeah. What, why why, why would you not accept, like, w- 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 tell me what, what the they, good reason they, of not accepting the person. Lot, don't they get a lot of money, too, for this? Like, isn't the U.S. like, thousands, like thousands coaching, coaching, coaching rates, like, just really high? Like, that's mind-boggling that they reject coaches when, you know, the, apparently the greatest coach of all time can't lead us to a World Cup. Like, that's 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 uh, mind-boggling. This guy's investing his own money, his own time, and he gets rejected? What is this? Like, an exclusive I'm done. Club? I'm done with U.S. soccer. I'm it's done the, with uh, them. It's the, Bye. It's the good old boys club. The good old boys club that is U.S. That is, yeah, with Bruce that, Arena. That's... Good old boys club leader Bruce Arena. How to fail to qualify for the World Cup and make excuses that's afterwards. Crazy. That's... Read my new book coming out this June on how I failed to qualify <laughs> for the World Cup. <laughs> I'd bu- I wouldn't crazy. buy it. I'm not buying that book. No. Yeah, well, I'm no. not going to buy that book either. I that's... wouldn't buy that book either. But... Even if somebody gave it to me, I'd chuck it right back at their face. That's how disgraced Bruce Arena's name is to U.S. soccer. <laughs> okay, well, let's uh, all right, let's, let's let's move on here to the third and final topic here of the the counterattack with Jake <laughs> Um We're gonna do the, we're gonna do a game. It's gonna be it's gonna be quick. Okay. Um, MLS came out with or basically announced player salaries uh, earlier this week or last week. Um, and I want you guys. Now you're gonna have you're gonna have like five seconds tops. Okay, we're gonna go back and forth until someone can't answer it correctly, and then the, then the game's over. <laughs> to name me one at a time, by the way. So we'll go Stephen Armand, Stephen Armand, until one of you guys either messes up or we get them all. Okay. Name me the 15 highest paid Americans in MLS. Americans. Americans. Oh, that's tough. Oh, that's gonna be tough. All right, I'm ready. All right, uh, go ahead. We'll start Michael Bradley. G- good. Armand. Josie Altador. Boom. Steven. Clint Dempsey. Yep. Oh, crap. <laughs> uh, Paul Ariola. Yep. Damn. That's a good one. Sorry. I know um, I got you. God. Americans? Dude, this is so hard. Kellen Acosta. Seconds. Uh, that is incorrect. Damn. Armand uh, wins. Yes. No, wait, wait, wait. wait. Armand has wait, to wait, give wait, another wait, name. Wait, wait, wait. I'll name one. I'll name one. Ready? Three, okay. two, one. Tim Howard. Uh, boom. And boom goes to Dynamite. What about Juan Adolowski? Is he on that list? Uh, here, here are the names on the list. You guys got Bradley, Altador, Howard, Dempsey, Dwyer, Bedoya, Cly- uh, I can't say his name. Kleisten. Um, Kleisten. What? Thank you. Wando, Beasler, Zussi, Shea, McCarty. Shea. Rex Shea? <laughs> Didn't uh, that guy McCart- just miss a massive, like, opportunity? A terrible miss? Yeah, he's... Mm. <laughs> he's a uh, DP. He's a DP. Yeah, that guy. Uh, Guzan, Ramirez, and Ariola. Christian Ramirez? Yeah. I'm assuming I don't. I, I'm, I'm basing this off a of Paul Tenorio tweet. He only did the he only did the last names. 
So I'm assuming it's Christian Ramirez. Ramirez is there. Has to be Christian Ramirez. Yeah, has to be. That's insane. Uh, wow. That is genuinely insane. Wow. Is it bad that we couldn't... Uh, that I was... Uh, no, because like, you know what it tells you, Armand? It tells you that the money in MLS is completely overrated. I guarantee you the top 10 lists of money spent on MLS players, I would say about 50% is not worth it. Dude, think about this. One is making 800K. Um, you know how much... Acosta is actually making 300K, Steven. So uh, he's not even close. But Kellen Acosta, I think, is a bigger name in U.S. soccer than Chris Wondolowski. The only reason why I knew. Less. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, did, did, did Colin Acosta miss a sitter, goal, a sitter in extra time in Brazil? That would have no, but he failed it. But he helped. But he failed to get to the World Cup. Oh, okay, that's World true. That's a bigger team. failure. All right, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, we don't. We don't yeah, want that, to yeah, that's a wow. Interesting. I, I, I would have not put Christian Ramirez on that list. Uh, that if, one was the biggest surprise to me out of all of them, actually. I mean, because. What he's hasn't played like a how much does, he, does this say how much he makes or just names? That was just the names. Like you can I mean, go and look that up if you want to. Um, I mean, but like it's it's Christian Ramirez. I mean, I heard he got a sizable pay bump. Uh, great he, goal. I, I know Christian Ramirez. What after Josie Altidore? I don't know if it's still this still is correct, but I know at one point he led the he had the most goals out of any U.S. striker not named. Josie Altador. That's true. I remember that. I do remember. Right. He that. was he was killing it in uh, the uh, NASL. Um, NASL. He was is absolutely killing it. That's why they signed him. Uh, or use him and uh, when they got back Ibarra when they came back. I mean, they were both really great in the NASL. Man, that's a really uh, interesting uh, thing with Ramirez, especially top fifteen U.S. player Christian Ramirez. Well, there you have it. The counterattack with Jake Quatrova. Up next is my sit down with senior coordinating producer of features for Fox Sports, Jennifer Pransky. The 2018 FIFA World Cup in Russia begins June 14th on Fox. As Fox has already done so, the previewing has begun. Without the U.S. men's national team, it's going to be a bit different. But the beautiful game continues. Senior coordinating producer of features for Fox Sports, Jennifer Pransky, is hoping to make the World Cup a special one. She joins me right now. Jennifer, thanks for joining the show. How's it going? Doing really well. Thanks for having me. So first and foremost, you've worked on a ton of different sporting events like the Super Bowl, Daytona 500, the World Series, even the Women's World Cup in 2015. How much different is this upcoming World Cup? Oh my God, it's so much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's um, it's it, that's really what it is. It's the largest event that Fox Sports has ever done in you know our 24 year history. So. Uh, it was. It would be easy just to say it's the biggest thing in my career, but when it's the biggest thing for your network, that's even more exciting and uh, you know scary, I suppose, at the same time. But uh, all, our hallmark has always been to try new stuff. So this is uh, this is what we do, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, this is Fox's first men's World Cup. Obviously, y'all had the 2015 Women's World Cup. Is there added pressure to put on a brilliant package? I think so, and it's very, for me, very welcomed pressure. You know, we've we, we've had the benefit of ESPN doing a great job in the past here in the U.S. with their broadcasts, and we're just looking to do our version, you know, to put that Fox spin on it, do what we do. Um, we have a different take on stuff, and uh, it's uh, it's very exciting. You know, it's, it's something new. So you, you briefly mentioned how ESPN has put on the packages for the World Cup in previous cycles how is fox is going to be different well i mean i think you can actually see that we have a different style across all of our sports um we just all the networks all the sports networks have their own style ours is very much you know what we did yesterday isn't what we should do today i think we have a great emphasis on forward thinking and innovation and and the other networks you know do their own version of that too but that's just our our mindset that we're always we're always pushing towards we're trying to um, push the boundaries 
we're, it, you know, in baseball terms, to use a different sport, you know, we, we'd rather go down swinging than go down looking. You know, not everything's going to hit, but we like taking those chances because, um, you know, we just want to show people something new that they might have never thought of before and, and really enjoy. Um, the other thing, I mean, just from a programming standpoint, we're, you know, putting 38 matches on broadcast, which if you take the last four World Cups combined, that's more games on broadcast than anyone's ever done. So just from a programming standpoint, we're trying to really push the boundaries and, and, and just do constantly be doing more. Now, I want to take a step back. TV and sports has evolved tremendously in, I would say, even the last des- decade. Could you elaborate how these factors have changed and how your job as producing these features have changed? Oh, well, the, it's a good question. The one way to look at it is just from the technology standpoint. I mean, the amount of cameras that I feel like we've cycled through just in my time <laughs> in, in television has been amazing. And to see the technology change from the fact that, you know, we were just shooting something the other day in 6K, which is, you know, the resolution that we were we were shooting stuff in standard definition just I mean, I can't even think about how many years ago. So just from a technology standpoint and the clarity and the, the just the beauty of the stuff that we're able to, to provide is one is one really, like, standout way I think that the viewer can, can see. Um, so it's just, you know, artistically, the same thing on that technology standpoint, standpoint uh, things that we can do um, artistically with animation and graphics, you know, there's, just so many more tools at our fingertips, and I think you just see that in across all presentations, whether it's the opening animation or just a, a, a graphic with someone's name on it, or if we're diagramming how far you know the Russian team is going to have to travel all across the country, all around the country to do their games and and things like that. There's, I think, the technology aspect is what you can see on the, the screen the most that shows the differences between, you know, now and 10 years ago. A, a big talking point of our show is talking about the American experience and the American soccer experience through the television, whether it's MLS, Champions League, or the national team. Could you provide any insight to what the American soccer viewer might not know about the game when it's being produced? You mean it's the, sort of the nuts and bolts about how a game gets done? Well, more so in the sense of how important are these viewers and how does Fox really care about the American soccer fan? We we love them, frankly. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're our viewers. They're sort of who we cater to. Uh, being able to help grow a sport is, a, is, a, is an honor and an opportunity. You know, the NFL's been big for a very long time. You know, there's not much that you're looking to, to to grow an audience there and to but and teach people you know it's sort of something that people kind of grow up with but with soccer this it is growing in this country and um to know that it's a game that is so popular around the world there's there's some kind of great unity in that to show that you know this is a sport that connects us to the rest of the world and to to be able to help bring people into it and help them understand the sport and help them love it is, is a very unique opportunity because I think in a lot of our other mainstream sports, you sort of are granted this audience. And with soccer, it's not necessarily the case. So plus it's, 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 a, it's a patriotic rallying cry. The fact that we get to have um, a national team playing games, like you, you get to get behind something that's very personal towards you. You know, sports are tribal. Mm. And um, you get to, you know, here in the States with other – with MLS, you get you pick it because of where you, which part of the country you live in, or where your favorite player lives, etc. You know, you you find a reason to fall in love with a team, and um, when you get to do it based on something like uh, patriotism, that's that's a wonderful thing, and we get to we get to we get to you know jump on that bandwagon. So until the World Cup passes, the elephant will remain in the room. The fact is, the U.S. men's national team will not be going to Russia. How has this affected? Foxes and your plans putting these features together? Well, first let me say I was very personally sad. I think we all were. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not in this business. We're only in this business because we're fans, right? right. So to start wow. with. So, but we, we all had to kind of, you know, once we got through that, 
you actually realize that there's great challenge and great opportunity in this. Um, as much fun as it would be to get to do features on the U.S. team and, and get people to rally around that, I enjoy the challenge of being able to show people players and teams that they wouldn't have thought to enjoy before. That's my job. I, it's my job to make people connect to something that makes them want to watch the game. And Every, and there's so many of those stories. And so we have now, the U.S. not being in it gave us an opportunity to tell more of those stories. You know, it's the, the little things about how Iceland is going to be a huge, people are going to love watching them. They're the, the underdog story, you know, and mm. um, learning, how to, learning how to do the thunderclap and things like that. Um, but then it's all the way up to, you know, getting to have more time to focus on the Messi's and Ronaldo's that are there. We, we live in a crazy time right now for soccer where the two two of the best people to ever play the game are playing at the same time and if you're a if you're a sports fan that's very rare and very special and people should cherish that so we are excited to be able to document that and tell that story and see what these two guys do you know not everyone got to live through magic and bird but they're mm. getting to live through Messi and Ronaldo that's a great comparison magic and bird and uh Ronaldo and Messi, but yeah, which, which, who do you think would be who? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a very good question. I would say um, Bird more so Messi and uh, Ronaldo more so Magic because Ronaldo has that more you know the L.A. Showtime type of deal, and Bird seems uh, Messi seems to be quieter like Bird did in in, in Boston. But it, it does. Well, I do wonder, and on the show we do wonder. The fact is. A lot of people don't necessarily like soccer here in America or to get those neutrals to turn to Fox. How exactly do you plan on doing that? I know you said you wanted to focus more on the other guys, but could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, of course. There's sort of that the big factor, I think, is that fear of missing out. Uh, same thing happens kind of around Olympics time when you have these, these huge events. You know, it's something that people around you are going to be talking about. It's going to be the highlights on your nightly, you know, on your phone and um, on the sports shows that you watch. And when some amazing thing happens and other people are talking about it and you didn't see it, you're going to start to, you're going to want to join in. And I think that's the biggest thing. When you know that the whole world is participating in something to find out who the best is, there's just something innate in us that we we have to know. We have to we have to take part. We have to watch. You can't be the person that didn't see the greatest uh, goal ever in a World Cup. You know, you just can't be that person. And so, while there potentially could be a slow start, who knows? I think, uh, but I think once this gets going, it's going to be something that people will talk talk about, and then you just realize you can't be the one to miss out. Is there a worry that people won't come to the televisions to watch the games? I'm actually, no, I'm not really worried. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause here's the thing. In, in, if you take all the past Men's World Cups, and as much as we, we love our, our home team, they don't necessarily make it to those final rounds. Mm. But people watch all of those other matches, and they watch all of those other games. So, um, you know, it's... As much as we wanted the U.S. in it, they probably had a shelf life, and people were still going to watch every all of those other matches. So, uh, I don't think there really is a worry, to be honest. So, one criticism I have personally had about watching the World Cup here in America is the lack of focus on the smaller countries. My co-host and I are both first-generation Americans, so our country has traditionally been buried behind the big names of Brazil, Messi, Ronaldo, Germany, uh, maybe England. I know you talked about, and I think I saw something, that you want to touch all 32 teams at one point through these features. Absolutely, yes. And I think that's really important because not every game is going to be Portugal-Spain. You know, mm -hmm. not every game is going to be Mexico-Germany. And it's exactly what we're talking about with, with are people going to watch, you know, without the U.S. in it. There are 64 matches. That's a lot of matches. Um, and... So it's my job to give people some kind of connection point. Even if it's something, you know, as small as highlighting a, you know, a, single, a single player and where they're from or what their story is. Or, you know, the other day we had an event and I told everyone, you know, it was, it was a Women of Fox Sports event. 
And I said, hey, you all need to watch Australia because I think their goalkeeper is the best-looking man in the whole tournament. <laughs> so, And I guarantee now I just got a whole room full of people to watch three Australian matches. So it's you just need that one little touch point that strikes a little trigger in you, then you watch that match, and then all of a sudden you've got something to cheer for. Or for a lot of people, you have something to cheer against. You know, mm. we all love I, – I love to hate the teams that I hate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I hope that you could put on a great package for my Swiss team uh, because not a lot of talk about them. Or in, in case of my co-host, Iran, because he really – that's where his parents are from. So any any production with them would be all, <laughs> would be a lot of fun to see. <laughs> I have, I have written that down. And, you know, Iran's an amazing story. You know, the mm-hmm. fact that there's so many Arabic countries playing in this World Cup, it's it's phenomenal. You know, you know, it's uh, I don't think people would have noticed that as much out here if they were focused just on the U.S. team. You know, mm-hmm. but Egypt is an amazing story. Iran could be an amazing story. There's there's just some, some great stuff out there. there. There, I think there are stories for every player, for every team, for every country. And it transcends the sport, obviously, into politics, into social issues. It just transcends it, and it, it's awesome to watch. Jennifer, I, I thank you so much for joining me. Last question, what country will you be cheering on? Ooh, that is a good question. Well, I've already told you why I'm cheering for Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, I, have a, a, I have some family from Belgium, so I'll probably be on their matches. I'll be root for them a little bit uh yeah it's a good question and i kind of just i kind of want Messi to win one you know mm. <laughs> i just my biggest thing and i know it's a cop out when you don't have a team in it i just want the matches to be good i want to yeah. see some cool yeah. upsets um you know i i i want to see those big matchups in the in the group stage like mexico and germany like you want to see the powerhouses face each other but then you want to see the little guy, you know, sneak up on the big guy. I think, I just, yeah, I just want the matches to be good because, I don't know, yeah, I want some surprises. That's what I'll say. I, I want some surprises. Yeah. And for the Australian keeper to do well. <laughs> yes, exactly. We need to, we need Australia to go deep into the tournament. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I am really excited for the World Cup. I know Steven is too. I know our boy Jake is so excited for the World Cup. With Super his, excited. Uh, dual nationality of uh, American and American. Um, <laughs> uh, More uh, like losing me... and losing. Yeah, losing and losing. Yeah, so uh, the preliminary rosters are out actually for the World Cup. And uh, it's kind of hitting it. That You know, it's kind of real. We're, we're getting into World Cup without the USA. Somebody what? tweeted out. So I don't know who it was, but somebody tweeted out. Uh, does anybody know when the U.S. men's national team roster is dropping? Um, dot dot dot. I uh, TV's co- the Fox Fox's coverage of the World Cup. All these features are gonna be cool. I think Fox is already doing something. How they're counting down. I think it's like thirty some days now. And they're counting down each team and what you need to know. Blah 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 blah. That that's all what Jennifer Pransky does, and it's super interesting in how she puts all this together but i part of me wonders if that's even going to an, uh, affect people's viewing of the world cup and she makes a really interesting point the fact is the usa always crashed at the round of 16 like mexico people still watch the quarters and the semis and the final that doesn't change it's i wonder if there's going to be that you know how there's that spike with the u.s men's national team when they play I wonder if we're not going to see that spike for the the matchups, and we're just going to see a, a flat line. Maybe Mexico gets that spike, but it's not that same spike that you get with the national team with the U.S. With the Yanks. Yeah, I wonder what's going to happen with MLS and that spike. Because usually they get a nice World Cup spike because you know everyone's watching USA USA because that patriotism and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, like will they get that now? I believe. I, I, don't I believe think so. that we will win. I believe that. That was four years God, ago. That's the dumbest chant, by the way. Dude, that was yeah, a I'm... fun chant last four years Sorry. ago. Sorry. Yeah, it was great when I was 23 years old. 
<laughs> when I was when I was you know at a pub you know at eleven o'clock in the morning you know six beers in yeah it was fun then but now I don't know <laughs> now I hear it I just cringe I'm like yeah we're not going to the flipping World Cup but seriously yeah. I mean Jake you're not excited for this would the are these features what you're seeing on Fox when you see these things on Twitter about come watch the World Cup is it you changing mean, you is it you like Elfrey's, moving the needle Elfrey's headquarters what do you mean. You don't see all. I, okay, by the way, literally, I get a huge kick out of seeing Lexi Lawless talk about how Fox Sports is your home for L trees. <laughs> there's just something about it that just makes me laugh because you know what? It must just kill him. To, <laughs> it must have killed him to say that. You know? No, I'm <laughs> sure it does. I mean, but I think it's such a cop out. Yeah, your home for L tree isn't Univision going to carry the games? Telemundo. Telemundo. So if you're, why are you going to watch on Fox? Well, I mean, you do know that Mexico is America's national team. Yeah, I'm not surprised there. The most popular national team that is. No, I, I yeah, I'm not excited. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm excited for the World Cup, but hearing people talk about it, seeing rosters coming out, it just reminds me that the U.S. won't be there. And what you two have going for you, because you both are dual nationals, you, you two, even though the U.S. isn't in the World Cup, you two still have horses in the race. You yep. guys, you know, Stephen, you got Switzerland, Armand, you got Iran. I got nothing. I'm not a dual national. I was born, in, you know, I, my parents weren't born in a different country or anything like that. You know, I I, I got nothing. I'm Italian. The Italians didn't make the World Cup. <laughs> uh, I'm Czech. Czechs didn't make the World Cup. I'm Polish. I guess I can, you know, pull for Poland. Um, but Would you do that DNA testing from Fox? Did you figure all that out? <laughs> oh god yeah, those, yeah. <laughs> the dna testing kits i mean the, oh god by the way that commercial uh, I, I i don't want to rip on fox i shouldn't i shouldn't do it no, this yeah but no I, I guess i'm just i'm just not as excited for it it just see i think it, but it, the it thing still is gut punched me now when i see it again it, it's just like we're not in the world cup because we couldn't get a freaking draw in trinidad and tobago I will be excited to see if, if what Pransky says comes true in the sense that they are going to genuinely tell stories from the 32 teams, the, the 32 countries that are participating in this global event. That's what I'm really excited to see because I want to know about what's going on with Saudi Arabia and its team or with particular my Swiss team. How are they going to promote that? Or the, the other smaller countries that people don't really know about. I was, I'm was i always tired of ESPN talking about the big teams. That's why I can't stand their soccer coverage. It's terrible because they talk about the same 12 clubs. They talk about the same similar MLS ideas, the hottest transfers, and they talk about LA Galaxy and New York clubs, and that's it. Or Toronto. They don't ever want to get in the nitty gritty. And then when they do open their mouths about the smaller nations or the smaller clubs in Europe or in America, they have absolutely no idea what they're saying. I hope that Jennifer Pransky and what she's doing with Fox Sports can change that because these features, I think, are going to carry that momentum because. There are a ton of dual nationals in America, and I'm sick and tired of hearing Messi versus Ronaldo when the World Cup is not coming down to Messi versus Ronaldo. Portugal might not get passed around the 16. Argentina is probably going to crap themselves with Egoin hitting the post 12 times wow. and Di Maria um, not passing the ball at the right moment. Something's going to go wrong with the Argentinian team, so it's going to come down to three countries or four, and it's Spain, Germany, France, and Brazil. I can. That's what's going to happen. I can guarantee you that. How are you going to promote the early games in the smaller nations? That's what I'm looking forward to. And that's what I'm going to have my notepad out and actually wanting to know about this coverage of this sport in this country. Am I supposed to like, respond to that? <laughs> like, Am I supposed to like say something? No, you're right. I mean, whenever you, but your your first problem is you're watching a little too much ESPN FC. Like, chill out, man. No, I don't like, though. It's just stuck in change, my change, freaking change, feed. Change, change it up. Change it up. Um, in in terms of, of uh, I don't know. The one gripe I remember when I when I when I was younger uh, that a lot of people in my family had with the Iran coverage is a lot of it turned to the political aspect of it and people were like we don't want to hear the political aspect of it we want to watch we want to hear about the soccer team because to be honest with you 
I, 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 everyone's excited for your Iranian national team. All my uh, Persian American dual citizens, whatever, where the hell you want to call them, um, they're all excited for it. But I bet you they can't even name five players on a team like I did with DC United. Um, I bet you they can't name five players on the team. Like it's, it, it, I, if they go, I wish they'd go. If they can go in depth, you know, talk about the players, they do their research. I think it'll be outstanding. And it'll be a fun to watch. If not, I'll just watch in Spanish. Sometimes <laughs> in Spanish. Late enough, so it's fine. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I, it, it'll be interesting to see. I am I just want them to actually encompass what the World Cup represents. And it's 32 teams and not just 12 players and four nations. And that's it. Because it just gets annoying. And it just I just don't care. I really don't. Like, talk about the English team, but also talk about... Egypt or and talk about Peru and Iran and Switzerland in Australia even though most of them don't have a chance yeah talk about them give people a chance to learn about these countries and you know about their about their soccer teams this is a once in a four-year thing I mean look I would love to hear more about you know uh, Morocco yes I, absolutely I, well, like a Morocco a lot of people are calling them a dark horse or whatnot a quality side I to be honest, you don't know much about the Moroccan national soccer team. I'm <laughs> thinking what I expected me to. And I'd love to learn more about them, you know. Maybe more about Egypt outside of Mohamed Salah. Yes. What like like what's more like more? Maybe bring on Bob Bradley to talk about them since he had time with the Egyptian national team. Fox, you're listening, give me that credit on that idea. Cause I know you <laughs> I know I, I know y'all I know maybe y'all don't think about that. But it's it's just things like that. Make it unique. Make it seem like, hey, you know, we're a part of this team. Go in depth with Mexico. I mean, cause they are going to do it, right? Because, you know, they're the home of El Tri. Go, go <laughs> in depth with fr- the French team, too, with the politics behind it. Go in depth with these nations. Talk about the influence of Iceland. Iceland, the Turkish players in Germany, the foreign players in Switzerland. Talk about it all. All right, Uncle Sam, Soccer Pod, Jake Watroba, Minnesota, Stephen Jodder in Wisconsin, and Armand Kafai down in Texas. We'll be back next week with another counterattack with Jake Watroba and some more stuff soccer related.